to do to this one before another one. Now I'm going to do a full rebuttal to this. What is it that this system would have allowed this person to be a professor? And for listening to this kind of thing, why would you be going to the University of Exeter? This is one when those who know me from childhood and now, I I've been wanting to scrap with this for years. some time. So let me have my fun. A lot of people have some disregard for school, sometimes in some isolated reflections. Libraries are a good thing, I like Wikipedia, and reading one book a week is a fine idea. But I hate school, and I hate all of its potential. I hope you think that the fact that I'm criticising a professor means I'm wrong. I'm also going to use quotes from another professor, same job as Francesca, Paul James Griffiths. And I'm also going to be using some of my own reads. I'm going to give you some offhand, Moses of Hores. Asked to write a whole comprehensive history of Armenia. He uses Greek, Chaldean, and Persian sources. Grégoire de Tour, writing history of the Franks from the 7th century in the reign of the Merovingians. And I know those of you who have been to school don't know what that means. Hello, puppies and kittens. Very, very pleased to have on a professor of Hebrew Bible and ancient religion, Jessica Stavrakopoulou. Welcome aboard. That kind of criticism based upon the idea that we simply cannot believe what the Bible says about itself. We have to start with the assumption that Paul contradicted Peter and mm. Matthew is off on his own thing over here. What it produces is always self-contradictory. It's a nod to Amen Ra. By the power of Ra. Whom I see as a template of the God of Western monotheism. That they were both based on the same character. Now some of what I read back then, Amen was originally an air god who was later combined with Ra, the sun god, seemed to have both become the same god, such that Yahweh is now seen as sun as well as whirlwinds and clouds. I chose the last name Ra to raise awareness of Behold, how we created your god. The power of God. So you think you've got friends in high places with the power to put us on the run. Play and that both of these characters, before they became full-on elementals, both had human bodies and they both had wives, and in fact the same wife. Nephthys, Hemsut, Kefnut, Hecht, Mafdek, Ra, Mutt, Mutt, when the priest went out against the other worships, like, kind of like Akhenaten, tried to replace the other Egyptian pantheon with a sun god. The Aten, yeah, I mean, I don't think that it that Akhenaten's monotheism was imported into ancient Israelite culture. I don't think it's that simple or that easy, nor historical. He had a wife, the goddess Asherah. And was that the same wife as Amen-Ra had? Seems to have been much more of a type of a traditional Levantine rather than a particularly Egyptian style goddess. But the word Asherah is, is also the cult symbol, which seems to have been a stylized sacred tree distinguish between the cult statue or the cult object and the deity. They were one and the same. English translations that these are quite often primarily Christian confessional and so are importing all sorts of bias into their translations. In saying that there were other gods as well as Yahweh in Israel, there were times when the Israelites were going to have worships of and some other gods. She isn't telling us anything new, but of them having other gods is seen as a turning away. So they think that this never happened. And that it was simply that Israel were people with several gods. You had to ask some dude in ancient Jerusalem, hey, you know, your goddess Asherah, isn't she just like the goddess? And then after that, the, we are, the idea we're talking about was just some idea. And you would say things like, for example, there was no real Elijah. That, El that Elijah thing was just put in there. What do you think of Methuselah? I think he's drawn on much older Mesopotamian traditions. Sumerian king list has all these kind of kings that live for like God knows how many years. And, and Oren Ra says this himself. The Noah character was known as the Asudra, Atrahasis, Utnapishtimen, since they all hail from different Mesopotamian regions. By the might of Horus, you will it's like be born us. Region. It's coming from the Hebrews themselves. And the Hebrews are descendants of the same tent as the Persians. I read uh, bits of the uh, the Avestas of Zarathustra, and I read the kingdom of the Lai ruled by Araman. And this character seems to be the template for the Satan character. The king's privileged position and his relationship with the patron deities crosses the line. He's disobedient. He, you know, he is godlike, but he is not a god. And so as soon as he starts to think of himself as a god, 
then everyone in heaven gets pissed off and like throws him out. That's exactly what happens to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, Adam Ra said in the debate against Kent Hovind. Your God, Yahweh, was originally a volcano God, which is how he is usually described in the Pentateuch. When you first said that, I was first wondering, what? What is it? What is it about that you were saying? When I read the Bible, uh, before I had read anybody else's interpretation of it, I'm following a column of smoke by day and a column of fire by night. But they're talking about a volcano. I mean, how stupid does he think when it, these when it people says that are? You know, there was a lot of mining. You know, mining is a very oh, like there's this column of fire over there. There's this smoke over there, far away, and no one figures it out. And no one, and no one from around that region comes over and says, "Oh, no, no, no that's just this. That's just this volcano thing. It's a mountain that you know." Uh, you know. Well, this is because of the fact that he believes in evolution, if you ask me. But simiaforms, which is, man, what a hard label to wear. Even when people can readily accept that they are primates who meet all the criteria of a pendulous penis and pectoral mammy with color vision and a brilliant mind and self-awareness, all in trade of a mere loss of whiskers? Call it anything else, but don't make us admit that... Here's this chap I was mentioning earlier about uh, evolutionary understanding and, and uh, influence on little thinking. Where is, where is this volcano if there is one? And am I on the right track there? It, it certainly looks like it. Um, well, I don't, I don't think you're on the right track. track. I think, I think you're, you're right, right to panic imagery was applied to gods who are particularly associated with smelting um, and craftsman gods. Which makes sense. Copper mines were really important in this southern Levantine area, in the ancient world. The mere fallible primitives who wrote the Bible is that it was written by ignorant and bigoted, superstitious savages who obviously had no idea what they were talking about. And literacy was very high. Architecture in those days, really what they lasted much longer than some of the best in the world. Not only that, they had sewage systems. They had underground heating in their houses. There was an understanding because evolution sort of affected the whole way that people thought. 1850 or so BC would ever have had a complex legal system. Therefore, it would have been written so early. But archaeologists actually dug up the Code of Hammurabi, which actually contains quite amazing legal understanding. The result of that was some of the evolutionists who had changed their minds. And they, they started saying, well, actually, Moses had copied it from an earlier source. So it went round the other way around. So Very few critical, rigorous scholars in my field would say, yes, Moses definitely existed. I think he's probably drawn on lots of different kind of folklore. A bit of Hammurabi. It's, yeah, basically stuff like that. I mean, I've, some scholars say that perhaps Yahweh started off as an epithet, a title um, of the high god Ale. Others say that he started a minor storm deity, probably somewhere from the region of what the Bible know, knows as Edom. Um, so it's a possibility that Yahweh, I mean, as a storm god, he's particularly associated with mountains. They... Pick up your city twig, boy. You're playing with the big boys now. But gradually is prioritised um, politically and religiously and socially by those people that we know as the ancient Israelites and Judahites. Might as well think that there are vipers in the side of on the Old Testament today. Uh, we gave the Old Testament to liberals a long time ago. Find one is just great, and one sitting next to it will add ways into your faith. Religious instruction isn't just inaccurate, it's counterproductive and degenerate. So as I'm going to claim that these Hebrew people are telling their own story as they always had as their beliefs. If these kind of techniques wanted to say that Genesis is really an amalgam mythology of whatever culture and belief was all around them, even then they've shown something that the Bible tells them the story in claiming specified ancestors. Moses himself, he's, he, there's, there's no evidence for him being a historical figure. Like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of that. It's all made up. The first mention of this site is in the book of Genesis in chapter 23. Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is at Hebron. Genesis records that later Abraham his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, and their wives were also buried in this burial plot. But the ancestors of these Hebrew people held captive as slaves in Egypt were Mesopotamian and Levantine people, with what their culture is as their heritage. But that's not exactly what I'm suggesting. What I'm going for is that these are the places where they are being recounted and remembered. 
is also the place and land and environment of the setting of these stories according to the Book of Moses. I'm only going one step further in saying the Hebrews are the ones that have the right version of these. My son, I have nothing I can give but this chance that you... For Alexander the Great, the best history book we have is written by Arion, based on two eyewitness accounts, Ptolemy and Aristobulus, who were there at the time and knew him personally. It's a man called Professor Sir William Dawson. Not just anybody saying that, but he's a chap who actually was a chairman of the Royal Society of Canada. I've long thought that the narrative in Genesis 7 and 8, talking about on the ark, can be understood only on the supposition that it is a contemporary journal blog of an eyewitness incorporated by the author of Genesis in his work. It mentions Genesis chapter 5, the book of Adam. So I thought, is it possible that there were some really ancient clay tablets which people had access to? It's an apocryphal work from about 250 BC. It's called the Book of As Asatir. And it speaks about this book of Adam. So as for the Edomites, I don't know what this is about. I don't know if she's been on an archaeological thing and that we can show that the Edomites have a notion. But there could be actually some truth to this. Except that it's not the Edomites who were the first to acknowledge him. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. They are unbelievers. And they are not people who don't acknowledge the existence of God. So maybe they will be talking about all of their beliefs, but somewhere also acknowledging that he exists. And it says also that they had established kingdoms way before Israel. And so from the perspective of first evidence, it may look like the Edomites invented him. It's also worth noting that according to this story, according to Genesis 9, the one from whom these Egyptian people who are not recounting these stories are descended from an unfaithful son, within the original ancestors of all these nations. The Semitic people who do recount them are the people descended from the more faithful brother, and there are also a lot of apparent similarities with what the Greeks believe who are descended from Japheth, who is also a faithful person, within the members of the original ancestral family. I'm going to do a project when I go through Hesiod's Theogony and show how it looks like these Greeks and Hebrews similar original beliefs at some origin. And with the Sumerian, your first man called Adamu. And there is a paradise called Dilmun, poor and clean and bright, where the lion kills not, the wolf snatches not the lamb. There was no disease, pain, deceit or guile. And the god Enki goes to the goddess Ninhursag. The side hurts him. She's caused a goddess called Ninti, lady of the rib, to be born for him from his rib, from his side. Adam and Eve had a choice to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, meaning to live forever as they were, or to learn about good and evil and become more than they were. Making the choice to know good from evil, to have a sense of morality and humility, distinguished humanity from the other animals, and made them like unto the gods of the Elohim, because this fable originated in Semitic polytheism. The Enema Elish. The oldest creation myth, also from the Semitic tradition and the original inspiration for the fables in Genesis. A parallel with Genesis, such as light being created before the sun and the stars, and the order of creation being the same, the mention of the deep and chaos, and a time of rest on the seventh day after man is created. The sixth generation of gods created man to complete creation so that the seventh divine generation could rest. In the fable of Eve's temptation, which was composed about a thousand years later, the serpent is the only character who told the truth. The Bible says that God lied. The serpent knew that Adam wouldn't really die on the day that he ate the magically cursed fruit. It could be a parable of our evolution. That's how I read it when I was a Christian. But it's a closer parallel to the old adage that you can never go home again. That once you take that step, there's no going back to that state of childlike innocence. Like a coming of age story. If it's a ladybird book fable, if it's Jack and the Beanstalk or something, if what you're saying is true, then why did God judge the serpent? And he's telling him because of what you did. One of the things he tells him is the son of the woman will crush your head. And he's saying that he will crush the head of that very serpent. Notice he's saying the son of the woman and not the son of the woman and of the man. He's talking to a snake. What do we know about snakes in terms of parenthood? The only reptiles to have a leathery shell are lizards and snakes, which were a subset of lizards. Dinosaurs, crocodilians, and birds are all in the archosaur side of the reptile family tree, and they all have hard calcium-covered eggs, and dinosaurs and birds are both warm-blooded, and all those things had tiny wings that could be used in sexual displays, but they were also really efficient to help incubate a larger clutch of eggs, as we see demonstrated in this over-rafter fossil sitting on its nest. Without the insulation provided by small wings, it would be impossible for this animal to keep these eggs warm. 
Remember when you thought that lizards grew cold-blooded, naked, and only have three chambered hearts? Are you embarrassed by that yet? 